I'm ready. So good morning and uh, good morning to all the participants again and uh, good evening to uh, Professor Mao uh, for uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, special lecture and his presentation for uh, the day one of the lecture series and in fact it is the day three of the entire program. So Professor Mao actually we uh, uh, it has been decided that uh, actually there are a lot of questions are coming from the participant side and you have seen uh, every every participant is very curious uh, to have their queries uh, to put in front of, in front of the speaker so we will have the lecture of around uh, uh, 70 minutes and then we will have uh, 20 minutes time for the discussion so uh, yeah so uh, Thank you, Professor Mao, and I strongly welcome you on behalf of uh, the whole organizing committee, my department and my university uh, for this uh, lecture series. And uh, you have chosen a very interesting topic, means you are starting your lecture from the fabrication of those material in which, for which this uh, the lecture series or the webinar has been planned means energy. So you are going to start with a very interesting talk, uh, which is based on the synthesizing the nano structured uh, materials. And uh, this is the actually the backbone of uh, this uh, lecture series as well as the webinar that uh, what are those nano structured materials that are applied for to issue the renewable energy or the uh, energy crisis or to meet the energy criteria. So with these words, I request from the mouth to please uh, uh, start your lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. And uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to share some of my, you know, experience and uh, thought about, you know, how synthesized nano structured materials um, is a, is a wonderful area. You know, I just sometimes I talk with the physicists, you know, or engineers, right? You know, if there's no way for us to synthesize the nano materials, you know, what do they do, right? So uh, in that way, I really didn't think this is a very important aspect. Um, so um, I will today I will talk mostly about the synthesis. I will have some slides related to the synthesized nanomaterials and properties, you know, but those I will go through them quickly uh, because in the next few days I uh, will get back to some of those properties. But I just want to show you that you know they are relevant the properties with the nanostructured material that we synthesized, right? So today, let's try to focus on the synthesis. Uh, keep that in mind. So first, I will start with, you know, uh, here I'm mostly talking about the bottom of synthesis method for nanomaterials. Um, you all heard about the, uh, the bottom down synthesis methods as well. Uh, but here, I mean, you know, uh, mostly focus on the, the bottom up uh, synthesis. So in, you know, based on the uh, physical phase of the synthesis, you know, technically we can, you know, I try to categorize categorize them into three type of um, uh, bottom up synthesis, you know, uh, in, including the solid phase, liquid phase, and the gas phase synthesis method. Solid phase synthesis is easy to understand, you know, if we have a nanomaterial, uh, the precursor, and go through a solid state phase, and then we get the, uh, 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 nanomaterials as well. So I will actually, I have some examples uh, related to solid phase synthesis. And then liquid phase synthesis is actually, I think it's the most common synthesis method. Uh, um, come, most of the common bottom up synthesis for nanomaterials. You know, there are different ways. And also there are so many of those methods, right? And also it's always under, under, under developing, you know, each of us actually, we can think about that as well. Uh, but there are a few, those, those common ones, right? You know, for example, the colloidal synthesis, uh, hydrothermal synthesis, template assisted synthesis, micro emulsion synthesis, soldier synthesis, you know, including the, also the electro deposition as well, right? Uh, today, I'm actually, I will introduce another method. It's called the modern salt synthesis method. And just uh, give me a few minutes, we'll get there. And of course, there are also uh, gas phase synthesis as well, uh, including the physical vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition, and the recently, more recently, I mean, uh, atomic layer deposition techniques as well. And uh, so all these methods together, you know, um, uh, 
Uh, in Naples, the synthesis of functional nanomaterials over a wide range of experimental conditions with a broad range of chemical compositions. So um, there are a lot of things we can play with. Uh, so here, you know, I will just show you some examples. Before we go to that, I want to show you some, you know, review articles we have uh, um, uh, co-authored, you know, I have co-authored in, in the past years. Uh, in terms of synthesis of uh, nano inorganic uh, materials. And here I'm also only focused on the inorganic nanomaterials, not organic ones. Um, so that's also keep in mind. If you are working with organic materials, you know, or even biological materials, those also can be made as nanomaterials. Right. So from these two actually we published, you know, when I was a graduate student, you know, that was a while ago. But more recently, uh, with Dr. Sandoz Gupta at uh, um, uh, BRC, we actually we more focused on the modern salt synthesis of the mechanic nanomaterials. So this is the, the paper just published uh, earlier this year. So if you are interested, you know, uh, please go uh, to take a look. And um, so I will show some examples, you know. Uh, by this method today. And um, <clears throat> so this is awesome. Sorry for the busy uh, slides, but I just want to show you that, you know, some of the examples where I've been uh, had the direct, you know, experience with them. Um, I'll go through some of these examples in more details. But one thing I want to I want to point it out is mostly you will think of nanomaterials, they are you know, uh, there are particles, right? You know, most of the times, but in terms of particles, right, they can be have different shapes. For example, here I'm trying to show you that uh, we can have spheres, we can have cubes, right? Uh, those type of particles. And then the other thing I want to show you is we actually, you know, uh, for application, a lot of times, you know, the uh, two dimensional. Uh, arranged particles are actually also very important. So here, actually, I show you a couple of examples, this type of ordered arrays of nanoparticles. Um, and then three-dimensional arrays as well. So here, here are those examples, right? Um, and if you were uh, at my talk uh, yesterday, and then you, you already know that uh, I showed some of those uh, three-dimensional and nanostructures already, right? Um, and then the other type of, you know, um, for example, this type of um, three urchin-like structures. And then um, they are nano uh, structured, but you know they are actually uh, hollow inside. Um, so those are the few examples, and then I will go through some details from now. Um, here I want to start it with one type of material because. Um, you know, from the my presentation yesterday, I talked about the photocatalysis for water splitting. So I will start with this one. Uh, yesterday, I talked about the tree-like nanostructures of zinc oxide, right? So um, I didn't talk about you know zinc oxide. You know, there are so many people working with it, right? But you know, I didn't talk about how do we develop new, you know, uh, uh, explore new materials of uh, the photocatalysis. So today I'm going to present to you one type of material, which is with this composition, okay? And um, so this material is got, you know, there's a lane for it, it's got the D-La uh, with uh, uh, this composition, CU. Uh, okay. So uh, the copper and the metal O2. So the copper here is actually not the common uh, two plus valence, and there's actually a monovalent uh, cation, and then this M cation is trivalent. And this material, it has a very interesting structure, and as you can see here, uh, it has this uh, layer structure, and while in between is uh, connected with the copper plus. And, um, and it depends on how this layer, this sheet of this um, uh, MN, MN3 plus and oxygen uh, uh, polyhedros and how it's organized, then we have the 3R and the 2H uh, structures and it depends on their stacking orders. Um, here, I just want to show you that, you know, this type of, this type of materials have been uh, get a, um, 
you know, get more uh, interested by uh, science scientists. And you can see here, you know, in terms of uh, the number of publications. Uh, why do you say this? You know, because this type of material is actually pretty stable in aqua solutions. So we, if we want to use it for photocatalysis, that's also a very important uh, um, uh, property. And then it has the excellent whole mobility. Uh, for those of you who study photocatalysis, you will know that, right? Um, most of the uh, photocatalysis, the electron mobility is high, but the whole mobility is low. That also, uh, because of the slow whole mobility, that limited the, uh, the um, photocatalytical efficiency. So that's also why it's very important to find uh, some good a catalyst with a high whole mobility. And uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, for some other applications, you know, the negative thermal expansion is also very important. Uh, that's why here I mentioned, you know, this type of materials has a strong negative thermal expansion. Uh, in terms of application, I just list a few here. You know, I, I don't want to go through everything. Uh, these are the, some of these publications, you know, recently. Uh, you know, uh, uh, other people have been explored. So here today we all focus mostly with water splitting. And um, so think about this structure, right? You know, uh, copper, of course, you, you know, uh, copper, this monovalent uh, copper, it can be replaced by silver, you know, uh, those type of uh, elements. But for the MS3 plus uh, um, uh, cat, the cation, you know, there are many, uh, those uh, trivalent uh, uh, cations, right, on the periodic tables you can see here. So that gives a broad range of materials, you know, for this type of data full size. So, but uh, here I will focus on the synthesis, that's what I promised, okay. Um, so for this material, in the past, we actually, we used the three synthesis methods. The solid state road, you know, that's the mostly common way we think, we could think about, right, you know. Um, so, but then the, the, uh, for this is because the copper is uh, uh, monovalent, right? So we need to keep this, um, uh, we need to make sure, you know, um, this is actually stays that way. And then there's a hydrothermal process as well. Uh, I will go through this a little bit more details. When, um, so these are the precursors we used and also we used, you know, uh, glyco and the PEG try to control the, uh, the, the, the shape of the, uh, the materials. And then uh, um, Dr. John Hagia Ahmed actually uh, started with this uh, model, a uh, solo uh, chemical route. So basically we have these precursors, you know, and then hydrated to get into the basic condition and then use the hydrosonication treatment at the room temperature for a few hours. And then it goes through the, um, uh, the anemian process. And then uh, we will be able to get the uh, soft micron plates. But I will show you some details about this. Uh, if we compare these methods, right, you know, the solar chemical route in terms of the uh, reaction synthesis temperature and also the uh, reaction time, uh, so especially the synthesis temperature is uh, lower than the solid state route. And then uh, in terms of the hydrothermal routes, and then uh, the, the con synthesis condition is much milder, right? So you can see here. The most important thing is, you know, uh, what is the, 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 the morphology, the, the, the materials we can, we can synthesize. So as I'm showing here, then you can see, you know, very clearly uh, by the solo chemical routes, and we get this type of uh, sub micro size uh, uh, plates. And then for, by the hydrothermal synthesis, we can get this, uh, uh, these hexagons. And uh, um, so they, you know, here, you know, this type of hexagons under this condition is about 40 nanometers thick and uh, a few hundred nanometers uh, wide. And then by the solid state synthesis, and uh, we got the micro size of spheres by, you know, and there are, there are a few micrometers in diameter. And here I just show you some uh, XRD data. And then, you know, for by all these three methods, we can get the uh, the four side uh, structure. Um, but here shows actually the precursor uh, for the solo chemical synthesis. And you will see that, you know, there is no uh, uh, four side phase form. You know, they are the, the hydroxide so, um, or the hydroxide carbonate. So 
Uh, that's what uh, we see here. And uh, then we did, uh, you know, take the Rama data as well. And uh, so we just want to make sure you really get the, uh, the foresight structure. And here, one thing related to this uh, the foresight material is very interesting. And we so uh, uh, we did a TGA, as you can see here. And uh, when we um, hit this up, and you actually will see uh, at the beginning, there's a little bit of uh, weight loss that because of the uh, uh, physical absorption of absorbed water. And then, but then after about like 400 degrees Celsius, and then you will see actually the, the weight increased, right? Most of the time we know that, right? By using TGA, we always, you know, uh, see weight, uh, see, we will see weight loss, right? You know, what happened with this material? Uh, the reason is uh, uh, it actually what decompose and uh, it becomes uh, copper oxide and the and then becomes this uh, copper gallate or uh, 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 material which is a uh, spinal structure and that gives you know uh, absorb oxygen from here and of course so that's why we gain we see this uh, weight uh, weight gain. And uh, we confirmed that, you know, after this uh, 400 degrees Celsius, and then we, we you know, based on exhaust, we receive these two phases. So uh, that's, you know, um, that's, uh, we got this, uh, this uh, three type of uh, um, uh, four cycle materials, you know, with the different morphologies. So then we did the OER, and then we also tested the HER, and as you can see, uh, now the exact and actually always gets the get the best performance, and uh, as you can see here, right, this is related to this curve is related to the hexagons, uh, you know, in terms of the OER, and then look at it here, and then the HER as well, right? So uh, all the obviously, you know, this uh, um, uh, the um, <clears throat> the uh, electrochemical performance is actually depends on the surface area and the morphology of the catalyst. Right, so we we thought about you know with the hexagons, right? You know, is there a way we can even make it smaller or thinner, right? Uh, if this, you know, we made this, we made the, the by the hydrothermal synthesis, right? You know, for those of you who work with the hydrothermal synthesis, you will know that, especially working we will work with the nanomaterials, we will say, okay, let's add some surfactant in the synthesis, right? So uh, we thought about this, and then we. Actually, we add a certain amount of SDS, uh, which is a sodium uh, diacetyl sulfate, into it, and then we did the hydrothermal synthesis as we did before. Uh, the only difference is with a different amount of SDS. So uh, here, you know, the in terms of the products represent, you know, zero represent there is no SDS, and then two, four, six with a certain amount of uh, SDS, and then we get the. Uh, uh, Copper gallate uh, nanocrystalline hexagon or the flakes. When they are very thin, we call those uh, the flakes. Um, so that's what, okay, let me get back to this a little bit. You know, we pick this SDS because here we have the copper and the gallium cations, right? So uh, we want to use this uh, R9 uh, from the SDS as, uh, to control the synthesis of this uh, plate. As I'm schematically showing here, right? So that's why that's how. And here, you know, we actually we can see that this is a SDS zero, SDS two, four, and six, right? And then we can see that the this plate of the flakes getting smaller and smaller and thinner. And um, then we get the um, uh, look at the uh, electrochemical performance or the and also they follow the electrochemical performance. And uh, as you can see that, I'm not going to this curve, but you know, I want to show you this uh, number, this numbers here. And you can see that, right? You know, this uh, on onset potential is decreasing and the current density increase, right? For both EC and the PEC, right? That's really proved the concept, okay? Uh, and also, we look at the cathode slopes as well, and you can see that, right? Um, <clears throat> the slope is actually decreasing, and that's also a good sign. And then, <clears throat> and then in terms of the 
top transfer resistance, we also see that trend. Um, and then, you know, the stability is also very important. So um, we actually, we did this and we can see that, you know, after the first couple of cycles and then it's actually, um, <clears throat> this nanoflex are actually quite stable. Uh, so that's a good thing as well. So uh, to summarize this part, you know, um, we actually, we synthesize uh, uh, this uh, data for set, uh, copper colored particles with different morphologies by using different methods. And then uh, for those uh, hexagons, we actually, uh, we can make, we can tune their size and the shape uh, by adding the factant. And uh, so that's, that's one type of synthesis, <clears throat> right? So following up, because I've been focusing on the hydrothermal synthesis, I want to show you a couple of other studies, which we, which I did, you know, uh, before, right? So this one is related to uh, titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is a so volatile material. And so when I was a graduate student, I really interested, you know, what, what we can do. So, um, Schematically, what I'm showing here, uh, so I started with commercial titanium dioxide powders, right? And then I go through uh, a hydrothermal process, okay? And uh, by basically by add, by add this uh, uh, anaptase powder uh, into sodium hydroxide solution, right? And then go through a hydrothermal synthesis and then I got the sodium hydrogen titanate nanostructures. And then I neutralize it. And then I got this, um, I got this type of, uh, uh, it's called the protonic uh, lipid uh, croctyl titanate with this formula, right? And so that's the, what this, what the composition of these different type of structures. And you, the other important thing is, depends on the hydrosynthesis conditions. Uh, actually, I can, we, we, I can synthesize nanotubes of this, uh, this type of titanate, or the nanowires, or the submicron wires. Uh, the difference between this is this are the smaller diameter, and this ones have a larger diameter. And then, interesting with that is, the next step, I go through a hydrothermal synthesis, okay? Uh, uh, with these different high, different kinds of uh, titanate nanostructures. And then surprisingly, and then uh, I got the uh, anatase nanostructures with the different morphologies. From these nano titanate nanotubes, uh, I got the nanoparticle, anatase nanoparticles. If I started with this uh, titanate nanowires, then I still get the nanowires. But if the or uh, uh, titanate sub-micron wires, and then I get this wire-like aggregates of hundreds. And um, so that's that's all about it, you know. Um, so that's why we call this uh, the size and the shape independent transformation of titanium dioxide. Um, the synthesis process, you know, it's, it's quite easy, you know, uh, as long as we have those uh, autoclaves, you know, uh, for example, this second step is done at the 170 degrees uh, Celsius for 20 hour, uh, 24 hours. And this first step is, you know, the condition is a little bit different, you know, uh, uh, if we want to synthesize this uh, three type of uh, titanate, right? Um, that's about the synthesis, you know, and, uh, um, and then, of course, you know, this, the, 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 you know, in terms of the applications, we actually, uh, I tested it for the catalytical activities. And, um, you know, um, <clears throat> I want to ask you is which, you know, which of these nano annotated nanostructures shows better uh, uh, for the catalytical performance um, in terms of uh, degradation of uh, um, uh, dye molecules, right? Um, if you look at the uh, TM images, right, these nanoparticles are actually quite smaller than this, uh, uh, this nanowires, right? Here is one micron, this uh, 20 nanometer long, right? You know, uh, these nanoparticles definitely have a much larger surface area. But surprisingly, when we 
uh, measured the photodegradation uh, activity, photocatalytic activity, this mammal wires actually show the better performance, much better performance than the, um, than the nanoparticles showing here. Of course, we also compared with the blank and also the commercial nanoparticles, amortized nanoparticles. Okay. Um, right. So why is that? And um, so we believe, you know, the this nanowire, the surface actually they have a lot of those um, um, uh, the kinks and also some of the defects. And uh, we believe it also have much higher uh, content of hydroxy groups. That also helps the uh, the photodegradation, uh, photocatalytic activity. So that's one thing. And then related to titanium dioxide. At that time, I was I was very interested with with titanium, right? So here you see that for this one, you know, the precursor is amethyst, basically is TiO2, right? And then we, I was thinking about, you know, can I use a titanium, you know, uh, as a precursor? So that's what I did. And uh, um, of course, this is a titanium zero, right? And so we used uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and still under the um, and the basic condition and the interesting thing is we got this type of a sea urgent -like structure, right? As I showed you, because this is under the basic condition, and so this type of structure is a uh, uh, is a sodium, potassium, hydrogen titanate, and then you know we still go through the neutralization process with um, a quite dilute um, uh, hydrochloric acid, and then we get this uh, hydrogen titanate. Just this is uh, the neutralization process is quite quite, quite similar as, uh, as the example I just showed you, right? And then we do the annealing, and then we get this anodized uh, titanate, you know, sea urgent structures. Okay, um, so that's the other process. You know, there's a lot of things we can, you know, as a chemist, there's a lot of times, you know, um, as a material scientist, there's a lot of times is, uh, we can play with all this. Of course, right, you know, the application that in the oxide, we know that, right, it can be used as sens dye sensitizer solar cells, you know. Um, so uh, here we did a little bit of uh, study, you know, uh, compared compared with uh, with the commercial uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. As you can see that, you know, this type of unique uh, um, sea urchin like titanium dioxide structure actually shows much better for uh, current. And uh, so that's that's something we did at that moment. And um, so uh, that's mostly related to the hydrothermal synthesis, you know, the examples I want to show you. Uh, of course, there are many other synthesis, other uh, uh, nanomaterials can be synthesized with uh, hydrothermal synthesis. Um, it's, it's a very unique technique and, uh, and also the uh, experimental setup is, uh, is uh, cheap. So that makes it uh, much easier, you know, for you know, any labs to, to do that. Um, of course, you know, one thing is uh, we need to figure out the right condition, right? Then we can, then we will be able to make nanomaterials. Uh, that's that's uh, that's also always one thing. Um, so, um, but that's what it, what it takes, right? So the next one I want to show you a couple of examples related to template synthesis. And this is also one in, interesting, you know, uh, studies I did. Um, so templates, right? You know, we can select the different type of templates. They are uh, soft templates. They are hard templates, right? Uh, so here I'm showing you one example using hard template, right? We know that they are type of uh, alumina membrane, okay? Um, so uh, it's uh, it's uh, an anodized uh, uh, H luminal template. So basically, it's a template foil, but it's etched. So it forms this type of uh, pores, goes through the whole membrane. And um, so I was thinking about, you know, can we use this template to synthesize uh, nanowires? And especially, you know, if we can dissolve these membranes away, and then they form the nanowires, and then they are uh, parent, right? They are they, they form as the rays, right? So how do we do that, right? You know, uh, for chemical synthesis, we know that the precipitation reactions happen quite often, right? 
if we have a reactant A and a reactant B, and then if we mix them, they will form precipitate, precipitate right? So here I want to the precipit precipitation happens, you know, uh, within the suppose. So that's what I designed. You know, I designed this type of um, containers, and then uh, these two. Uh, where is my cursor? Okay. Finally, get it back again. So, um, so I actually I talked with um, our um, uh, machine uh, machine engineer and to help me help him make this type of uh, um, uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, tubes, and then on both sides, and then I was be able to uh, put this type of membranes in between. And then I add the uh, reactant A and the reactant B on each side, and then they did react, you know. And then after that, I can just uh, dissolve the, um, the membrane. Aluminum membrane is very easy to get rid of, it, right? With, uh, with a weak, you know, acid or base, and then we get it away. And uh, uh, if I do it well, if I, um, if I, you know, um, uh, put it, you know, put the membrane on a substrate before I dissolve the membrane, and then I can get this type of uh, rays. And of course, you know, if I don't care about the ways I get a rays, I just, you know, uh, throw this uh, membrane uh, in a uh, acid or base, and then I get the nanorods. And so that's that's one easy thing. And um, yeah. You know, you gave me a jack script, so that's a, that's a good idea, I think. Um, so, and also, of course, by the same idea, you know, later on, we we also uh, we also synthesize some other type of um, uh, nanorods, you know, oxides, fluorides, you know, um, you can think about it. Um, if you can think about some other, you know, precipitation reactions, you know, you can use this method. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's one way, but then, you know, in terms of some of the memory devices, you know, uh, there is a need for us to uh, get the nanoparticles um, uh, flat, you know, lay on the substrate, right? So, um, so at that moment, you know, um, I've been thinking about what are the templates we can use, right? So here, most of the you know uh, examples. I mean, I mean, all these examples I'm showing here, um, especially the these two on the bottom, and we use a soft template. So here, I actually I used we used this um, uh, ACE layer proteins, and uh, this type of proteins is interesting. You know, under certain conditions, it will lay flat on the surface and it forms very regular pores. And then, um, you know, we use the atomic layer deposition to get the metal oxides deposited in those pores. And then later on, we just get rid of, you know, um, get rid of those proteins. And then we, get, we, we have the metal oxide uh, and nanoparticles uh, in a very regular, uh, in a very specific location on the substrate. So uh, that's one thing. I'm showing. I'm showing on this corner here. Okay, that's the process. And uh, uh, you know, we also tried out some other methods. You know, for example, use a dye block of a polymer, and that is also very uh, unique technique. And the 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 other important thing about this is because we form the particles, and also the particles are next to each other. There is no big gap in between. So uh, for memory devices, you know, so uh, we expect that this type of uh, structure can uh, increase the, uh, the density as well, right? The storage density. So that's what we, we were interested in at that time. So with that, I think that's pretty much with uh, what I'm going to talk about the template method. Okay, so far I talked about, I gave examples of two synthesis methods, right? The first one was, Hydrothermal synthesis, the second one was the template method. Okay, so next one, I want to really be spend a little bit more time on 
and the other type of method. So it's called the modern salt synthesis of nanomaterials. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether I go, I'm going too fast or <laughs> it's okay. Um, but, but, you know, um, if I go too fast, then we can, you know, hopefully uh, we'll leave more time for questions. Uh, but I'll, I'll slow down a little bit. Um, so this method is uh, something I, I'm pretty proud of myself. I mean, other methods as well, but this one is, I think I, I spent more time uh, on this method in recent years. And also that's why that's also uh, gave us a uh, review paper, you know, we just published this year. And um, so this method is one is very interesting method, you know, uh, for some of you probably heard about the flux method, right? Uh, but flux method mostly um, is, um, is uh, the, the amount of salt used is uh, small and also flux method mostly is being, have been used to make single crystals, which has large sizes, uh, all the micrometer particle particles. But here, when we talk about the modern salt synthesis, actually, uh, when we mix the salt and the precursor, the salts in general are more than the amount of the precursors. So here, the salts, you know, when it's melt, it really acts as a solvent, just like the hydrothermal synthesis, right? Or the, or the solvent thermal synthesis, right? Hydrothermal synthesis, we use water as a solvent. Hydro, uh, the solvent thermal synthesis, we use organic solvent as a solvent, right? But here, the unique part is we use more than salt as a solvent. And then, you know, then uh, um, uh, the precursors go through a nucleation and the growth process, right? Eventually, you know, we get the particles, you know, either nanoparticles or micro-sized particles, right? Uh, the other, the, there is another important thing I want to mention is the modern salt, right? You think about this, you know, they are um, ionic species and, you know, there's, there's nothing else, right? You know, other than the precursors and the product. So the ionic strength in this reactor, in this uh, in this solvent, is very high, right? So that's why for some of the precursors, even though they are very difficult to dissolve for in, in water or in organic solvent, they can be dissolved in this modern salt. So that changes the synthesis kinetics, right? Um, and also change the thermodynamics of the precursors. So that's why, you know, a lot of times it gives, you know, different morphologies, you know, it gave us the uh, nano-sized particles. Um, so that's why, you know, this is actually the key I really want to show you, right? Before we demonstrated this, you know, mostly the modern salt synthesis or the, the flux method synthesis, you know, people you use, use them to make, uh, um, large crystals. But here, you know, we go the opposite direction. We use this method to synthesize nanoparticles. Um, the other important thing I want to mention is um, the, the experimental setup is really, is, is, is relatively uh, um, simple, right? You know, uh, the hold the precursors and the modern salt, we use the crucibles. And the different type of crucibles can be used. Uh, we, you know, the other thing is actually we don't need to use those uh, noble metal crucibles. We here we use uh, we most of the time we use the uh, ceramic crucibles, right? And to heat up to certain temperature, for example, 500 C or, or 700 C degrees Celsius, you know, we just need a furnace. Okay, it's a tube furnace or box furnace. Most of the time we use a box furnace, and that's it. Right, you know, when we look back in terms of the advantage of this method, you know, it's really simple. It's a scalable. You know, we can uh, easily make, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, several hundred milligrams of uh, nanoparticles. Um, that's for nanomaterials uh, synthesis is actually uh, it's quite uh, quite high. Right, um, it's just use a regular uh, crucible. Right? Of course, we can use a lot of crucibles. That's totally possible. It's quite reliable. You know, I've been uh, for this synthesis process. You know, I've been developed, and then I asked. You know, I had so many different you know uh, students. You know, pick up the synthesis. You know, 
they can easily do it. Uh, generalizable, as I will show you, you know, we can see, use this to synthesize the different type of materials, cost effective, because the modern salts used here, they, will, they are low cost salts. Uh, lower temperature compared with the solid state synthesis, a free, free agglomeration of the formed nanoparticles, and I will show you uh, that. Uh, but before that, I want to show you some uh, in terms of the cationic factors of the modern salt synthesis. Right. So if the precursors are solid, uh, solid, and then the initial size and the shape of the precursors are also important. Um, and then of course, the type and the purity of precursors, especially what type of precursors we use. Right. Um, then the type of and the amount of the salt, as I mentioned to you, um, you know, we need to consider the ratio of the precursor and the salt we use. Right. So that's what we, what I mentioned, you know, what I, I, I mentioned here. And then the temperature, reaction temperature at the time, of course, that's, you know, for synthesis, that's always important. And sometimes, you know, we can add a surfactant as well, right? Um, one is surfactant most time, you know, it will help to uh, mix, the, you know, help us to mix the precursor and the salts. And then after the synthesis, you know, the remaining impurity from the uh, salt uh, precursor component, right? And then whether they get the kind of agglomerates as well, you know, and uh, those type of factors, right? So uh, to get this connected a little bit better. And uh, um, um, so I want to use one specific example, for example, here, you know, um, uh, I'm using to uh, the example to synthesize the strontium titanate, right? So um, for the synthesis we used, actually we use the titanium, titanium dioxide as a precursor for the titanate bond. And then the strontium, we use the strontium, uh, um, uh, we use this precursor, uh, but if we, um, but if we use the strontium uh, carbonate or the chloride, um, uh, it's difficult for us to uh, get the strong titanate, pure strong titanate. And then, in terms of the salts we used, you know, we can use uh, chloride, hydroxide, and um, and the nitrite, nitrate, as well. And then the the ratio of these uh, precursors and the salts, you know, uh, the the one, you know, uh, good ratio is one to one to twenty. Um, so. Then, then the reaction time and the uh, the, the, rea the the reaction temperature is actually higher than the melting point of the salt, right? Because that's where the lane come from, right? The, the salt should the salt should be melt. Um, you know, sometimes we use a surfactant the MP9, for example, and then because we use the, for example we use the sodium chloride, so right after the synthesis we can easily. Uh, purifies and it's full the nanoparticles by just washing with uh, with the water, right? Uh, so and then you know they form the products are uh, free of uh, agglomerate, and um, yeah. So I hope that gives you a little bit a uh, better idea about you know the synthesis of uh, by the modern salt synthesis, and here in terms of the free of agglomeration, I want to show you some example one, you know two. I mean as uh, scanning electron microscope images. Um, so this one on the left is actually the uh, strontium titanate nanotubes we synthesized by the modern salt synthesis. And you can see that, right, there is no hard agglomeration. Uh, of course, they stay with each other, right, because this is in the powder form, right? But the commercial uh, strontium titanate nanoparticles, you know, um, you can see there's a large amount of uh, agglomeration, right? Um, so that's one thing. And then, as I mentioned to you, this is a very versatile method. So, uh, in, you know, here I show you a few examples, right? We can use this method to synthesize some simple oxides, binary oxides, for example, iridium oxide, uh, iridium oxide. And also, actually, for iridium oxide, recently we found out that we can make a normal mold. Um, by tuning the ratio of the salt and the precursors. And then for this type of com more complex metal oxides, you know, as I told you before, we can synthesize the strontium titanate 
we can see the calcium titanate um, and also, you know, this type of um, this type of uh, mixed, you know, uh, titanate. And then um, for the for the uh, barren zirconate that I show here, you know, we can tune the shape of those particles, and we also can uh, um, we made this um, this type of uh, complex um, um, uh, proboscide structured materials and uh, synthesizing you know the nanoparticles. So uh, these are just for some examples. And uh, so next, what I want to show you is. Uh, since I talked with you about the uh, hydrosomal synthesis and also the modern salt synthesis as well, I want to compare, you know, uh, one specific metal oxide by these two methods. Okay, so that's the next thing I want to I want to show you. Um, again, you know, uh, this is something I already mentioned in terms of the advantages. You know, um, yeah. So I want to use the uh, ethylene oxide as the example. Actually, the open double oxide as the example. Um, so uh, by the hydrosomal synthesis, we actually we will be able to make the nanotubes, and then by the modern salt synthesis, we will be able to make nanoparticles. Um, so both methods are easy and simple, and they, they are robust synthesis procedures. Um, uh, by each of these uh, methods, you know, um, we can control the morphology, control the doping level, uh, especially, you know, the doping level, this is very important. You know, uh, the next couple of days, I will talk more about this uh, type of, um, um, this type of uh, doped materials. So uh, here, and then the other important thing is, let me start with the hydrosomal synthesis of this because we spent a little bit more time on this, to understand the hydrosomal synthesis of these nanotubes. Um, this is the ex situ type of study. Um, so we did this synthesis under different pH um, and then uh, also different time. And then we uh, we we check the, the products by uh, X-ray uh, X-ray diffraction and also the um, electron microscopy, and then we can see that. Um, so the the uh, the pH value of the synthesis, you know, you need to reach certain level. Otherwise, you know, we will not be able to get the ethylene hydroxide. Um, so. So uh, that's one thing, and then you know, uh, you know, when we just start the synthesis, you know, we actually we are not getting the hydrogen hydroxide, and only after a certain time, then we will get the hydrogen hydroxide. And then when we look at the morphology, you will see that at the beginning of the synthesis, you know, these nanotubes they are starting to form, right? While the end is actually the the ends are not perfect yet. Right. Uh, with a longer time, eventually, you know, this uh, this um, nanotubes completely form, right, and also their end becomes uh, becomes more perfect, becomes a uh, field, right. Um, so that's that's the exedial type of study, and then we were trying to propose, you know, really understand, right, in the literature, you know. Uh, there are different type of uh, mechanisms, you know, how this grow, and um, so um, so that's that's one thing. And then, you know, what we propose is actually we believe, it, you know, it is start to form this type of metastable uh, uh, e-train comp uh, complex, right? And then uh, it starts the nucleation and the growth of the e-train hydroxide nanotubes, okay? Or still on this uh, on this slide, right? Oh, oh, um, you know, I will I will start with this slide again, and uh, so 
the, the important thing is, right, you know, we made the hydroxide and uh, by the nitrosomal synthesis, so we want to get the oxide nanomaterial, so uh, it goes through the dehydration process at 500 C for here, we use a three hours. And uh, you can see that, you know, from the X-ray diffraction pattern, you know, we, we see that the phase transition has really happened, right? And at the same time is we look at the morphology and we can see that the morphology resolved. So uh, we have, we started with this hydroxide nanotubes and then we still get the oxide nanotubes. So that's perfect. And um, so, and then the other thing is we, we wanted to understand this uh, dehydration process a little bit more. Uh, because in general, we we'll think, yeah, this dehydration process is uh, it's one step process, right? You know, but we found out that actually by in serial studies, this dehydration process is actually a two step process, okay? So in between, it forms this oxyhydroxide, and then eventually it goes, it forms the oxide. Uh, so how do we see that is actually here if we look at this XRD patterns and we started with the hydroxide, right, uh, increasing the uh, calcination temperature. So, you know, um, before 250 degrees Celsius is still hydroxide, but then slowly it forms this uh, intermediate phase, which is, um, um, which is uh, uh, yttrium oxyhydroxide. So here, you know, because because there is no hydrogen oxyhydroxide GC, GCPDS pattern. So uh, that's why I use the ethylene oxyhydroxide as a reference, because this is not a typo. Um, and then slowly after that, and uh, uh, around 400 or 450, 450 degrees Celsius, so it forms the uh, hydrogen, hydrox hydrogen oxide. And so uh, that's clearly we can see. Uh, with the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we also can see um, um, the similar trend. The only thing is, you know, the X-ray absorption uh, uh, spectrum is not that straightforward. Uh, it, you know, we need to go through a quite a detailed analysis, so I'm, I don't want to go through here, but definitely you can see that, you know, at this certain temperature, this pattern is different from uh, the other ones, right? Either before or after. So uh, that's one thing you know I want to show you. Um, so that's that's definitely you know that's something new you know which is not reported before. Like you know this is a two-step process. Um, um, so that's that's you know one thing I want to show. Um, yeah, I already talked about this, right? You know, and then. Um, uh, other type of techniques also can convince that. Uh, for example, by the uh, TGA and the DSC data, and it also also show that, you know, especially like uh, by the TGA, we can clearly see there is a two-step process. Okay, so it loses some water first and then loses another water uh, molecule uh, at higher temperature. So this is completely consistent with the in situ XRD and the X-ray absorption spectroscopy results. So uh, schematically, we can show that, right, you know, this is a two-step process. Start with the hydro hydroxide and then oxyhydroxide and then form the oxide uh, eventually. So um, then, you know, if I put some other, you know, data together, you know, the, we did more uh, electron microscopy data, and then you can see the, you know, this oxide, Hydrogen oxides actually they are uh, very nice uh, uh, crystal um, uh, materials, and you can see especially this one you know it looks so clear, and then the electron diffraction patterns also confirm that you know uh, these nano materials they are single crystal, so um, that's that's the other thing, and. Uh, um, about two days later, I will talk more about this, um, the uh, um, luminescence properties, you know, of this type of um, um, materials. So, um, it's related to the synthesis of this uh, hydrogen oxide material, right? So, they are very, very simple. So, the next thing I want to go show you is 
modern salt synthesis actually is more capable to synthesize complex metal oxides. Uh, when I say complex metal oxides, means at least there are two metals. Okay, uh, it's actually different from here. You know, here there are also two metals, right? The erbium doped iron oxide, but here, you know, um, because the erbium is doped in, into uh, iron, uh, so um, so so uh, I still consider this is a simple binary uh, oxide. Okay, so that's there's a little bit difference here. So the first type of uh, you know, materials I want to show you the example of the perovskite metal oxides. And then the next one is the uh, this type of metal oxides. So um, I'll go to uh, more details later on, but it, uh, let's start from here. Uh, the proboscides, right, you know, they are so, uh, you know, have so many uh, different properties for very diverse applications. So that's, of course, you know, the synthesis of their nanoparticles is always interesting, right? Because they, there is a coupling of the spin, the charges, the orbitals, and the lattices, right? Depends on the compositions, of course. Uh, but, you know, this is a quite an uh, active research area. So that's why um, I, you know, we start with some of the uh, synthesis with this type of nanomaterial. So here is something I showed you a little bit earlier. Uh, this type of uh, proboscide nanoparticles. And um, so, um, so we did this, you know, so I, I will not go through the uh, synthesis details um, uh, again, um, but, you know, if you are interested, we have uh, many uh, published papers related to this. Uh, some of them, they are, you know, um, um, uh, we published, you know, um, the early, uh, 2000, but you know, recently we still have some new publications related to this progress guide. Uh, these are some of the properties, you know, I, I mentioned to you. Uh, I'm not going into the details, but you know, definitely you will see that you know, these are the they have uh, magnetic uh, properties, and it's different from. Uh, the, uh, the the literature report, you know, for example, you know, uh, people made films, you know, powders, but here we made the nanoparticles, you know, so some of these uh, uh, parameters, they are different from the literature. And um, and this is the other one, right, you know, uh, with a cobalt here instead of uh, nickel for this one. So, um, so that's that's related to this type of proverbs guides. Recently, we also worked on this one, uh, National uh, Strontium Copeland. So uh, this is the other one as well. So, but I want to spend more time on the other type of uh, complex metal oxides, which is the one we spent more time in recent years. So this type of material is called the uh, uh, pyrochloro. And um, you know, with this composition is actually uh, the A cation. Most of the time, it is a trivalent. Uh, so the M cation is uh, tetravalent. And um, so, you know, the, the this type of comp compound, you know, uh, people already studied, you know, for different uh, properties. For example, uh, this type of compounds are pretty uh, stable. Uh, they can be used as a host. And uh, they are radiation tolerant, and um, you know because of this, uh, the complex uh, metal oxides, you know, it has uh, quite compositional flexibility and uh, functional stability. So that's why you know we've been working on, you know, we are interested in working on this type of uh, nanomaterials for a while now. Um, in terms of applications, you know, they are also pretty. Um, uh, broad applications, you know, for luminescence host materials, the nuclear waste host materials, which I will talk tomorrow a little bit more on this. Um, uh, people also use it for thermal barrier layer and the oxidation catalyst and scintillation materials as well. Um, so, why this material is so interesting? Uh, so, we would look at the structure first. Um, so, basically, it right, is a cubic structure material. Um, but then, because of this, uh, um, uh, because the uh, oxygen vacancies and also depends on where the oxygen vacancies. So, the, the, so this uh, black dots represent the oxygen vacancy. 
So we have this order the flow rate structure and then the order the pyrogrow structure. But while the formula is exactly the same, right? So um, for the uh, flow rate structure and then the oxygen vacancy actually um, can be any of this. Um, oops, okay. Uh, any of these uh, uh, columns, right? Um, but for the all of the pyrogloss uh, structure, and then this oxygen vacancy is only stay at specific locations. That's why we call this as uh, ordered, and then this one is disordered. So uh, what determines of uh, uh, whether it's a disordered or ordered, and uh, it depends on the composition. Right. First is you know. Uh, so this is a uh, um, this is a formula in terms of the ionic radius of the A cation and the M cation. If it's um, smaller than one point six, then it will be the fluoride structure. If it's larger than uh, one point four six, is the pyrogrow structure. Um, that's the, the the empirical formula. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way always, right? Because, you know, especially now if we can synthesize the nanoparticles. So you will see this 1.6 is roughly the value. And um, so, and then the other important thing is, um, you know, this type of materials, you know, because of the thermal, uh, as we mentioned, right? You know, it can be used as thermal barrier layers, right? So it has, must have very high melting point. It does, it has. Like the melt point is larger than 2,500 degrees Celsius. That's pretty high, and that also makes it the synthesis much uh, very challenge, right? Especially if we want to synthesize them as a nano uh, materials. So initially, you know, my 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 qu the question to myself is, uh, were, could the modern salt synthesis be used to make this um, uh, pyrochlor uh, nanoparticles, right? So um, that's one thing. Uh, before I go and uh, um, you know, then because of this unique structure, right? You know, uh, if we take a Rama, um, most of the time, you know, this disorder uh, of uh, fluoride structure has only one Raman peak, and then for the order of pyrogonol, because this oxygen stay at a specific location, so uh, we normally we can several Raman peaks. So. So the Raman spectroscopy is a very unique technique to differentiate these two structures. While because both of them they are uh, cubic structure, and uh, so normal time the uh, the lab scale uh, X-ray diffraction diffraction uh, cannot differentiate these two structures. So a lot of times we rely on Raman spectroscopy, and so uh, how do we synthesize this uh, type of nanoparticles, right? So um, the interesting thing is this A cation and the MEMA cation, they are quite different. So by the uh, method, like uh, well, how we use to, to synthesize the uh, proboscite nanoparticles uh, is difficult. So, um, so that's why for this, this uh, pyrochrome nanoparticles and the way we started with uh, co-precipitation process. So what it is, is we, co you know, we start with the precursors and then we precipitate them and we form a, okay, let's get back. So um, we precipitate and co precipitate them, we form this type of amorphous precursor and we dry and we wash and dry and then we mix with uh, salt. Okay, here, you know, we use a nitrate and then do the calculation at 650 degrees Celsius for a few hours and then we get another volume. It looks pretty straightforward. And um, now, right, of course, you know, um, so, but initially, you know, I developed this thesis as a method, you know, in 2009. And um, so now, you know, we can, we actually, we can synthesize this many different type of uh, uh, pyrochlor uh, nanoparticles. So um, this method, you know, as I mentioned here, it happens at the 650, so which is much lower temperature and uh, compared with the solid state synthesis. 
and also because um, later on, you know, this is um, we use this as a host of materials to dope with a real real earth as a dopant. So uh, how even distribution of those dopants is also very important, right? Compared with the solid state synthesis, definitely, you know, we have a much even distribution of those dopants because of this uh, complete simulation process, right? Uh, as I showed you, you know, the nanoparticles have a softer agglomerate uh, aggregates, not like the soldier synthesis method, you know, soldier synthesis method normally give uh, uh, a lot of uh, hot agglomeration. And then the particle size reduction, you know, we already formed the nanoparticles, we don't need the, uh, um, um, yeah, so we don't need uh, uh, other methods, you know, for example, we don't need the male, uh, the, the, the particles, right? Uh, so that, you know, uh, avoid the surface dead layers uh, formation of the particle surface. So there are many, you know, uh, there are many advantages of this model of synthesis. And then, uh, as I told you, you know, we actually we can synthesize uh, different compositions here. I just show you different A sites, right? You know, uh, elements and also the P sites elements here. And uh, you can see that the X ray diffraction patterns, you know, those peaks shift because of the ionic radius of the A cation and the M cation. And uh, um, we can see that from these ICM images, you know, the particles are relatively quite uniform and uh, they are everywhere. And also from the high resolution TN images, we can see that these particles are single crystal. And uh, they all have this type of faceted shape. And uh, so we believe the, 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 the synthesis follow a in the facial reaction controlled mechanism, uh, not a diffusion controlled. So that's if the, because these are the cubic stru crystal structure, right? So it gives the uh, cubic, uh, the cubes. Uh, in terms of the morphology. So uh, for some of these particles, you know, we, the particle size is actually here is about 20 nanometers. But uh, later on, I will show you, we actually, we can tune the, uh, the particle size. Okay, so it is actually this slide. I can show you this. So the interesting is how do we control the particle size? It's actually, uh, is um, it's not, I mean, we, we, could, we definitely can uh, uh, control the particle size during the model salt synthesis step. But here I want to show you is quite interesting is uh, when we use the ammonia as a precipitant. And uh, uh, we found out that when we change the ammonia concentration, we actually, we can uh, eventually, we can tune the particle size. And so that's that's quite interesting. And also, you know, um, by further annealing of the formed uh, nanoparticles, we we also can we can further tune the particle size. So as I show you here, so with these three ammonia concentrations, we cut these three samples, and then we pick the one of this and did the further annealing uh, in air, and then we cut two more samples. So you can see here, uh, these are the five samples, you know, uh, in terms of the diameter of the nanoparticles, uh, based on XRD, uh, use the Scherer equation, and then you can see that the particle size keep increasing. And then uh, from SEM images as well, we can, we can, we can keep the particle sizes. Right? Of course, these two methods, you know, they are different uh, mechanisms, right? Um, and that's why the particle sizes are, are different. But you know the trend uh, is the same, so that's one thing I want to uh, point it out here. And um, then you know we just wondering, you know, why this happened, right? You know, uh, the particle size can be controlled by the coprecipitation process. Not you know we don't need to uh, uh, do that during the uh, model salt synthesis step. Right, as I mentioned to you earlier, the precursor is uh, amorphous, right? Amorphous uh, powders is more difficult to characterize, right? You know, um, uh, as we know, right? And because they're amorphous, so uh, we've been thinking about, you know, how do we do that, right? You know, how do we uh, determine the particle size of these amorphous precursors? 
So eventually we, uh, we, we seek the collaboration uh, with the scientists that missed, we got a little bit of preliminary results uh, by using the uh, SNSS, uh, small angle neutron scattering. And uh, as we can see here, you know, these are the three examples, you know, the precursors um, uh, um, uh, co-precipitated by different uh, concentration of ammonia. And then, um, yeah, it takes a little bit time to analyze the data, but what the, 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 uh, what, what we got here is, um, um, <clears throat> what we got here is, you know, then, um, so, so because the science is sensitive to the particle size and this is, this is distribution, right? For not larger particles, the science will scatter wave frequencies will uh, decay faster. So, uh, if you see this one, right, this uh, this uh, black and the red one decay faster, uh, that means the particles are larger. And then the green one has a smaller particles. So that means you know this one has a smaller particles, right? Um, so, so that's, you know, um, that's, uh, oh no, so I, I, I'm sorry, I think I is the opposite way, okay. Uh, yeah, so the green one actually um, decay faster, right? So it means it has a larger particle size compared with the other two. So that's consistent with this, right? So you see this uh, three here, it has a larger particle size than the, uh, 0 0.1, 0 1.5, and then 0 0.05. So um, that's 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 consistent. You know, it is also consistent in the way the the final uh, pyrochlorine particle size. So uh, that means you know the particle size of the amorphous precursor is actually coordinated with the particle size of the final crystalline nanoparticles. So that's the uh, that's the conclusion really here. Um, and also the other question is, you see that, right, for the modern salt synthesis, the temperature we use is 650, right? So the question is why we pick the 650? Uh, for that is actually, uh, other than some trial and errors, you know, we also, uh, we also did the in situ X-ray diffraction patterns, right? So here you can see at the room temperature, you know, we get some balance and then at 250, 225, you know, we don't get any peaks in, uh, anymore, right? Um, and then after that, then we get the patterns correlated to the, uh, correlated to the, uh, correlated to the, the uh, pyrochlorine structure, right? Um, uh, starting at 650. So that's why we picked, I mean, around like 625, 650, and that's why we use the 650 for this for the synthesis temperature, right? The question here is, where are these patterns come from? Okay, uh, when it was at the low temperature, right? As I mentioned to you, uh, the precursor is amorphous, right? But sodium chloride, uh, sodium nitride, nitrate and the uh, potential nitrate, they are crystals, right? At the low temperature. So that these patterns here, they actually come from the, the salt. And then at this temperature, and those, uh, uh, this uh, mixture of these two salts, and they melt, okay, uh, at the eutectic temperature, right? And while the, the, the product has not formed it. And then, you know, at 650, and then we form the uh, nanoparticles. So that's what we see here. <clears throat> Um, earlier, I mentioned that, right, for the co-precipitation, we used uh, uh, ammonia, and we found out actually uh, the urea also can uh, do the job. And uh, urea is actually, uh, in certain way, is actually even better, because urea uh, in, in literature is called the urea precipitation, it's called the homogeneous precipitation, because when we mix everything together, uh, um, the pH is not high enough, so there's no precipitation happened yet. And so uh, uh, for urea to act as a precipitant, we need to heat it up. We need to heat the mixture, uh, this, this solution up to um, 
to about like 60 degrees Celsius to 90 degrees Celsius. And then you will precipitate. And then we get the um, we get the precursor, and then we do the modern salt synthesis, and then we get the nanoparticles, right? So uh, one thing we notice that is, you know, by the urea synthesis, the quantum yield of the particles actually uh, is a little bit higher than uh, if we use ammonia as a precursor. And also from the GM images, you can see that even though uh, the nanoparticles we, you know, synthesized uh, before that showed you it has a, a soft agglomeration, right? But when the particles synthesized by urea as a precipitant, uh, the particles are actually even better distributed because it goes through the, um, the uh, homogeneous precipitation process. Okay, so the next one I want to show you is how about we change the A cation and what will happen to uh, during the synthesis, and especially with the uh, the crystal structure, crystal phases, right? So as I told you uh, uh, earlier, you know, there's uh, there's an uh, empirical formula, right? In terms of this uh, uh, ionic ratio. So for lanthanum halfnate, and you know, this ratio is about 1.45, so which is very close to 1.6. So we say this, uh, the uh, radius ratio is about, uh, the borderline, but then for the other five, uh, they are all have the disordered fluoride uh, phase because of this ratio, right? You see here. So um, we want to do the synthesis and then see how whether this is consistent with the literature, right? So, but this called precipitation, we found out that is actually more complicated than what we saw. Um, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Ahmad, how much time I have? Time is uh, almost over, but uh, you can finish as soon as possible. <laughs> okay, I'll go a little bit faster. Um, oh, I can say maybe maybe I save this to tomorrow because tomorrow the topic is still relevant. So um, so I, I will see just you know uh, see what the, uh, maybe start the um, Q and A session. As you wish. If you want to continue now, you can continue. If you want to drag it tomorrow, it, it, this is up to you. This is up to you. Okay. Uh, let's 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 save it for tomorrow because it, it will take some time. Um, yeah. Okay. I have. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I have a few few slides that will take me. Yeah, it will take some time, yes, because they, 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 these slides having details. To yeah, yeah. So we will have tomorrow these slides. So now we Sounds can take the yes, 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 yes. Sounds good. Can, yeah. yeah, we can take the question from the audience. So I request Dr. Upanaryas to please come up and uh, share the questions of the participants with Professor uh, Mao. Hello, Professor Mao. Hope you're doing good. Oh, yes. Uh, the first question is why controlled shape is important in nanomaterials? Oh, oh that's, that's, uh, that's a great, uh, great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, nanomaterials, people actually, you know, want to control the shape. Um, and a lot of that is difficult, right? Because we know that the crystals is, uh, uh, you know, crystals, uh, nanoparticles are crystals and uh, uh, is uh, surrounded by different facets of the uh, crystals, and uh, um, and the, the number, the, the number, and the type of uh, atoms on the surface, right, are different on the different uh, uh, facets, and uh, um, you know, especially for catalytical uh, properties, you know, right, they are basically the surface uh, uh, reactions, right. Uh, so that's why you know people aim for. Uh, um, you know, uh, control on uh, in terms of the shape. Uh, the next question is related to delafocyte. Uh, what are the 
I mean, how can delafocide be used apart from HER and OER? Can it be used to degrade organic pollutants? Yes. Yes. I didn't uh, personally involved with that, but uh, um, let me see. Um, so you see on this slide, you know, some other researchers actually did that. Um, for example, the chlorine, uh, I mean, the visible light, even uh, this uh, uh, phosphate reduction, removal of nitrate ions, you know, uh, um, for the potential, uh, for the, for the electro potential toxic ions, CO2 reduction, and uh, water split. The next question is, what are the neurotoxic effects of TiO2? Oh, okay. Um, I think that, uh, that's definitely a, a, another big research area, right? I'm not an expert on that, um, but, but I, I definitely I think there are some literature on, on that aspect. Okay. Which morphology is better, octahedron or cube? Which has higher catalytic activity? Um, where is it? Catalytic outside? Yeah, for the catalytic activity, which morphology will be preferred? Will be will it be a cube or a octahedron? Oh, okay. The um, the um, I think this is related to. Uh, I think it totally depends on the nature of the reaction. What kind of the organic transformations you are using? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the the uh, the reaction. Depends on the catalyst. Yes. So um, for different systems, there are uh, quite some uh, studies on on that aspect. That's a that's a wonderful question. Um, that's also something to keep us busy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Because for different systems, you know, the, 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 that relationship is different. Yes, it is. And it also depends on the surface area. Yes. yes. Which is the best synthesis method to get accurate morphology in TiO2 based nanocomposites? Oh, uh, the best method. I, yeah, I think that, um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a big question. Um, but but I, I think you know so far, uh, if you really want to you know want to say that um, compare with these two methods, right? I, I showed it here. Uh, they are, they are, they are both I, I like both very much, you know, because uh, this one, you know, I got the sea urchin like structure, you know, um, it's it's a beautiful, you know, if I when I start looking at under the microscope. Um, but, but but then the other thing, you know, if you really want to think about uh, compare the photocatalytical activity, uh, I still believe uh, this one, the synthesized by the hydrosomal synthesis, uh, has better performance uh, because this is, you know, it has um, this 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 type of nanostructures that are not uh, uh, calcinated, so it still has some oxy or oxygen or hydroxide uh, ligands on the surface. So for, for, for the degradation, I think that gives, uh, um, gives uh, extra affinity. So you have used SDS as surfactant. Are there any other surfactants which are good for synthesis? For, in, for instance, CTAB. Um, yeah, C tap could be also uh, work. Uh, we just yeah for this one we, uh, yeah for this one we didn't try that. Um, yeah, that could work as well. And the, what is the effect of SDS on the morphology of nanomaterials? Um, for this synthesis, uh, it is mainly we use it to control the morphology. Um, but but a lot of times, you know, from similar studies, um, uh, we believe, you know, uh, it's uh, it's com it's quite a difficult to completely remove uh, um, uh, the SDS uh, from the surface of this uh, 
these are eight factors. Uh, generally, for so, the different surface area, we must study the ternary phase diagram. And in the ternary phase diagram, you can choose the best system. And there are the certain parameters which basically actually decides the uh, the shape of the surfactant aggregates, which actually play an important role for the morphology control. So basically, it depends on uh, the uh, parameters which are associated with the surfactants, like the uh, packing parameters, surfactant packing parameters. Double uh, not ratio, as well as the uh, concept of the phase diagram, which basically plays important role for uh, the uh, shape and uh, size control while using either the SPS surfactant or the CSAS. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, one, one follow up with this is, you know, um, um, if you you may wonder, right? You know, when we add more and more SPS, it looks like the this uh, this eight seconds and the flakes getting smaller and thinner, right? You know, the one question is why why didn't we add even more, right? The question, the the, the reality is when we add when I added too much SPS, and then we cannot get the uh, the uh, the full size uh, uh, anymore. So that is following up with the, the, the question, you know, SPS is not just act as a factor here. So it definitely play other roles as well. The next question is also related to the morphology in which you have discussed for morphology. You have added SDS and in one you have not added SDS. So the morphology is very clear in the one in which you have not added SDS. So please enlighten with the morphological aspect which you have shown in your slides. Mm -hmm. Is this one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the question? The question was that in presence and in absence of SDS, we observe that the morphology is clearer in absence of SDS. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, that's a. Uh... That's the, um, the um, you know, this is a technical challenge, right? You know, when when this uh, particle is getting smaller and thinner, um, it's more difficult to get uh, uh, very clear uh, images, right? So for those of you who use the uh, electron microscope, you will notice that, especially the scanning electron microscope, I mean, both the electron, uh, scanning electron microscope and the uh, Transmission electron microscope. When the particles are getting smaller, it's more difficult to 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 um, to take uh, good images. The next question is how field cooling and zero field cooling parameters affect the magnetization data. Is it if is it effect of ferromagnetic parameters significantly? Um, let me see. So, so that's related to the magnetic properties, right? Um, yes, yes. I believe, yes, I believe the particle size and the shape that also uh, could affect the, um, the ferromagnetic property. Um, so I believe there are some studies uh, on different systems, but not with this type, uh, the, the type of uh, metal oxides I showed. Um, so we we thought about it, um, actually try to synthesize uh, different particles, and then uh, because of my students change, so uh, we couldn't continue. Oh, that Next. could be something interesting, definitely. Okay. Yes, there are effects. I mean, cooling parameter does have an effect on the magnetic properties, which again is, like you said, is related to the morphological features as well. So next question is how to reverse the agglomeration process in nanoparticles? Reverse the agglomeration, oh, okay. Um, I mean, you know, there are there are there are there are a lot of studies on that, right? You know, try to do the surface organization and with especially with organic molecules with uh, polymers. You know, um, 
but 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 for a lot of the studies, you know, especially when I talk about the uh, luminescence later on, I will talk about that. You know, we try to avoid those uh, um, those uh, organic uh, ligands. Um, so that's why you know, um, the other thing I, I actually I didn't mention about the uh, the modern solar synthesis. So compared with the colloidal synthesis um, or, or, or even the hydrothermal synthesis, if we use a surfactant. Uh, so the modern salt synthesis, you know, they actually um, on the surface, there is no those, there, there is no uh, such ligands on the surface. So that's the okay. advantage. Then why are uh, generally oxides used to form nanomaterials? Or why oxides have more importance in the synthesis of nanomaterials? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, no. First, I want to mention is oxides are not easy to form ox uh, nanoparticles, <laughs> right? <laughs> they are not. Um, so, so uh, why today I only showed metal oxides is because um, I just tried to uh, stay focused. Um, on metal oxides, and uh, that's that's my personal preference, and and also um, you will see I I coined this name for my research group, and uh, as my last name, so um, yeah, that's why I stayed with oxides. Then there's a last question, which are the widely you preferred TiO2 based nanocomposites for the removal of organic pollutants in water treatment? Um, yeah, titanium dioxide is, um, you know, is one of those uh, magic materials, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a chip. Uh, it's a chip is already widely uh, commercialized, uh, so that's why. But of course, it, it's, it's not a perfect material, right? You know, for photodegradation applications, you know, uh, because of titanium dioxide, I mean, the regular titanium dioxide, um, uh, the band gap is, uh, is too big. So, so that's why recent years, I believe um, they are still many more studies on uh, titanium oxide. For example, there's one is called the black uh, titanium dioxide, which is uh, basically has, um, has, um, has uh, uh, many oxygen vacancies. So, yeah, that's, 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 you know, that's related to, you know, uh, um, I mean, not just, you know, whether we can synthesize uh, nanoparticles of titanium dioxide or not. They are, they are commercial, they are cost uh, uh, effectiveness, uh, those aspects as well. What is the role of precursor in molten salt synthesis? Oh, the uh, the role of uh, the precursor. Okay, so yeah, today actually I didn't talk about that uh, that much. Let me see whether I can get to that slide. Uh, yeah, precursors are very important. I think I mentioned a little bit on this. Um, you see here, you know, when we synthesize the strontium titanate. Um, so it works, you know, when I use uh, the strontium oxalate, oxalate, but uh, not strontium carbonate or strontium chloride. Uh, the reason is, um, so this uh, strong, strontium oxalate, you know, um, it will decompose at a, a certain temperature, and then it forms uh, strontium oxide, and then that makes it easier to react with the titanium dioxide. Um, so, so the precursors definitely play a big role. Um, so this is from this example, and if I go to the other one, I'll show you. Um, 
for example, this one, this one we, we did that as well. So I briefly mentioned on this, right? So if I, if I uh, make this, uh, uh, you see this uh, uh, light thread here directly with the, um, with the salt. Uh, actually, I couldn't uh, get the, um, the uh, uh, pyrochlo uh, nanoparticles. So only when I went through this, uh, uh, the co-precipitation process, and then I can get this uh, uh, pyrochlo nanoparticles. So the precursors actually definitely play a huge role in the synthesis. And there's a question that why generally oxides are used for the synthesis of nanomaterials. Um, that, that is because we uh, we live in an environment with ox full of oxygen, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, in general, metal oxides are, 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 are stable in the, in our ambient environment. Uh, so it has many advantages, you know, um, related to the, uh, their, their final applications, right? Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's one obvious reason. So with this, we have all the questions posted and satisfactorily okay. answered. I would like to thank you, Professor Mao, for giving such a okay. such an informative lecture based on on the synthesis of these energy materials, metal oxides, and discussing their chemistry in detail. And we hope to meet you in future as well in the lecture series to have more insight about the different properties of these materials and their applicational potential in different fields. Thank you, sir, for being with us, for staying up late night and for you know providing us much insight about the structure and properties of these materials thank you sir you're welcome and uh, hopefully see you tomorrow again yeah sounds great